How do you imagine ancient megaliths, perhaps Stonehenge in England or the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt come to mind? They've become household names. Millions of people visit these sites every year. But thousands of miles away from such tourist hotspots, there is a mystery. Ruins of a city that is several hundred years old. And it doesn't sit in a desert or on a grassy plain. Its former inhabitants constructed it on a coral reef in the middle of the Pacific. The tiny island nation of Micronesia lies between Hawaii and the Philippines. The country is composed of 600 islands and islets. Because of its remote location, very few people visit Micronesia. The little tourists they have mostly come to go scuba diving in its azure waters. They often miss the opportunity to visit the only ancient city that stands on a coral reef, Nan Madal. Its home island is slightly smaller in size than New York City. Its ruins are made of heavy stone columns. There are walls and platforms, but one thing is missing – art. There are no ancient carvings to help archaeologists determine how ancient islanders constructed the site. Still, an international team of researchers was able to date Nan Madal. They presume that the history of the city goes back to the very end of the 12th century. For reference, these were the High Middle Ages in Europe, right around the time Richard I became the first king of England. In the Caroline Archipelago, where the island sits, this was the time when a powerful dynasty reigned over the island nation. Its chiefs ruled for a thousand years and unified the islanders. This enabled them to construct something as imposing as Nan Madal. One of the local legends said that the final resting place of the first of these chiefs was somewhere among the ruins. National Geographic launched an expedition to investigate this oral history. And sure enough, they discovered a tomb. It was the size of a football pitch. It featured a labyrinth of walls and passages, just like the ones found in the Egyptian pyramids. The list of similarities doesn't end there. The stone structure in Micronesia didn't seem to have a practical purpose, and a lot of effort went into building it. Its construction presents an engineering mystery for archaeologists. The same can be said for the pyramids in Egypt. The recently discovered tomb offers a clue. It contained an underground crypt which was capped off with a basalt stone. This is a volcanic rock that forms after lava cools down. It's dark in color and rich in iron and magnesium. The whole island is made of a similar volcanic material. It used to be part of an ancient volcano that eroded over time. Basalt boulders can be found all over the archipelago. They're in the shape of long hexagonal columns. The shape is not unusual and can be found all over the planet. Perhaps the most impressive site of basalt columns is Giant's Causeway in Ireland. These rocks formed from 1 to 8 million years ago. The locals probably sourced them from several quarries on the island. This is where the mystery begins. They each weigh several tons, so it's unclear how the natives transported them to the site. They had to navigate the entire width of the island and a lagoon covered with mangroves. These are dense shrubs and trees that grow near the coastline. And the size of the site is impressive. It spans close to 190 acres of a shallow coral reef. That's four times the surface size of Grand Central Station. As you might know, the Great Barrier Reef off the northeastern coast of Australia is the largest coral reef system on the planet. But it's a completely natural formation. The coral reef that supports Nan Madal isn't. It's man-made. Stone structures there rest on around 100 artificial coral reefs. The tribes that used to live in the area constructed each and every one of them. They stand at a height of about 3 feet above the waterline. Archaeologists were amazed by the clever building technique. Ancient builders would paddle out at low tide and retrieve coral from the surrounding waters. The conditions for it to grow fast here were perfect. Then, they placed parts of the coral inside underwater frames of stone. Once the first level was filled in, they added another row of stones and repeated the process. This allowed the foundation to rise above the water level. These islets were crisscrossed with tidal canals. The site had 12 walls to protect it against the sea. Harbors today still have similar breakwaters. 
the general layout of Nan Madal earned it the nickname the Venice of the Pacific. The coral base was strong enough to support the weight of all those basalt columns. Some estimates reveal that all the stones used in the construction weighed 250 million tons. This makes sense when we look at the largest monoliths on the site. These are massive stones that can be both artificial and naturally occurring. An individual cornerstone from the city walls weighs close to 55 tons, and there are several of them stacked on top of each other. The wall they form is higher than a telephone pole. In 1995, the Discovery Channel did an experiment for a special on Nan Madal. They constructed bamboo rafts to test how the ancient builders moved stones around. They were a fraction of the width of the real monoliths. The rafts sank almost immediately. The site's been sitting uninhabited for centuries now. The island's first settlers came by sea around the first century. Historians believe they arrived from the nearby Solomon or Vanuatu Islands. The city became a regional administration center at the end of the 11th century. Its heyday is associated with the powerful ruling dynasty. It lasted for nearly five centuries. European traders knew about the island for a long time. In the mid-19th century, the Spanish established schools there. In 1873, a Polish anthropologist was the first to systematically explore the ruins of the city. He found heaps of coral, simple bracelets, necklaces, and stone axes. There were also round discs with a hole in the middle that probably served as currency. In modern times, the island became part of Micronesia. Today, the local tribal chief is the supervisor of the ruins. His title dates back to the times of Nan Madal's builders but the locals cannot explain how exactly their ancestors erected the stone structures. The country's former top archaeologist was once quoted saying, We don't know how they brought the columns here and we don't know how they lifted them up to build the walls. Researchers from around the world were determined to get to the bottom of this mystery, quite literally. In 2019, an American team of scientists performed the first ever LIDAR scan of the site. This type of radar uses laser wave pulses to scan under the surface of the Earth. This allows the technicians to create a 3D image of the ground below. The scan revealed a complex irrigation system on the tiny island. This probably explains how ancient Micronesians were able to supply the nearby settlements with drinking water. When it comes to food, it was probably boated in. According to the local population, historians estimate that at the time of the city's construction, 20 to 30,000 people lived on the island. In 2016, UNESCO inscribed Nan Madal as a World Heritage Site. The future of the city is uncertain because of the state the waterways are in. They're overgrown with mangroves. The vegetation is undermining the existing structures, and more can be done to promote the place as a tourist attraction. The site gets about 1,000 visitors annually. Compare that to 50,000 people who visit Easter Island each year. Both destinations are pretty far away from the nearest mainland. The distance from Nan Madal to California is more than twice the length of the Mississippi River. Imagine a place that could literally start at one end, trek over 1,800 miles straight to the west, and still be stuck under that massive canopy. This place is like a haven for all sorts of crazy creatures, hosting around 10% of the world's species. It's always been seen as this wild, untouched paradise where humans haven't messed things up yet. You know, like a glimpse into how the world used to be before we spread like wildfire across every continent, causing chaos everywhere. I'm talking about the Amazon region. That massive jungle turns out to be hiding some seriously cool secrets. For centuries, people have been talking about these lost cities deep within the forest. We're talking about El Dorado, the legendary city of gold that had Spanish explorers going crazy venturing into uncharted territory, never to return. And even in the 20th century, the adventurous Perry Fawcett went looking for the lost city of Z and disappeared into the jungle, leaving us all hanging. Scientists have actually found evidence that ancient cities did exist in the Amazon. But how did they find these hidden ruins in such a dense and remote forest? Well, they've got this awesome technology called LIDAR. Basically, they hopped into a helicopter and used light-based remote sensing to digitally strip away the canopy and reveal the ancient ruins of a massive urban settlement around Llanos de Mojos in the Bolivian Amazon. 
The place was once home to the Kasarabi culture, which thrived from 500 to 1400 CE. They had these incredible urban centers with huge platform and pyramid structures. They even had raised causeways connecting different suburban-like settlements spread across miles and miles of land. These guys were seriously ahead of their time, and they had an epic water control and distribution system with reservoirs and canals. So yeah, the Amazon rainforest wasn't just some untouched wilderness. It was actually heavily populated and even urbanized for centuries before recorded history of the region began. But the thing is, a bunch of people turned a blind eye to the fact that there were actually some pretty cool architectural sites lurking around here that totally deserve some exploring. Scientists predict that in the next 10 to 20 years, we're going to uncover a ton of these cities, and some might even be bigger than the ones we're talking about here. Michael Heckenberger, an anthropologist with the University of Florida, points out that we've seen some similar settlement features, like moats and causeways, in other parts of the ancient Amazon. This new research reveals something totally mind-blowing. Past examples of urbanism in the Amazon were more like groups of villages connected together, not quite what we'd call urban. You see, they were missing those fancy larger centers with their grand architecture and stuff. But guess what? Yanas de Mojos has got them. This place is the real deal when it comes to a fully urbanized Amazonian landscape. So, in the Llanos de Mojos region, a bunch of ancient settlements have been found. These were home to the Kasarabi people, who were all about hunting, fishing, and farming maize. We're talking about hundreds of sites spread across 1,700 square miles. But these sites were so remote and hidden in the tropical forest that it was like trying to find a proverbial needle in a haystack. A team of archaeologists weren't going to let that stop them, though. They decided to take to the skies and use some fancy LiDAR mapping technology. Just imagine an aircraft flying over the area, shooting out a bunch of infrared beams. These beams hit the ground and bounce back, giving us the distance to different objects. It's like creating a super detailed map from above. Using computer software, these genius scientists were able to strip away the trees from the images revealing the Earth's surface and all the ancient archaeological goodies hidden beneath. And boy, did they strike gold! They found a whopping 26 unique sites, including 11 that nobody even knew existed before. So what about these 26 super cool sites? Among them, we've got Landivar and Kotoka, which are like these huge urban centers. And get this, we already knew they existed. But the new maps revealed they cover one and a half and one half square miles, respectively. These centers are surrounded by moat and rampart fortifications, like something out of a medieval castle. And they've got all sorts of crazy stuff inside. We're talking artificial terraces, massive earthen platform buildings, and pyramids that reach over 70 feet tall. All these epic buildings are actually facing the north northwest. It's like they were trying to align themselves with the cosmos or something. This kind of cosmic worldview can be found in other ancient sites in the Amazon, too. Now, let's take a bird's-eye view and strip away all those pesky trees. We can see these two centers in all their glory, and they're actually connected to a whole network of settlements through a bunch of causeways. Picture it like spokes on a wheel, stretching out for miles. Canals also stretch out from these main centers and connect to rivers and Laguna San Jose. It's like they had their own water delivery system going on. These ancient guys totally reshaped the whole landscape with their crazy cosmology. The only bummer is that their impressive architecture was made from mud brick. While it looked amazing back then, it just wasn't as durable as the limestone used by the Maya. What happened to the Kasarabi and their settlements is still a big mystery. But based on dating at the sites, it looked like they disappeared around 1400 CE way before Europeans arrived in the Amazon. One theory is that a massive drought hit the region and messed everything up. The researchers found these massive water reservoirs at various sites, which is pretty interesting, considering how rainy the Amazon is known to be. Who knows if they were for drinking water or farming fish and turtles? But hey, severe droughts have happened in the past, and it only takes a couple of bad harvests to make people pack up and move on. What's even more interesting is that these communities thrived in the same area 
where this guy Fawcett we mentioned before went missing while searching for his lost city of Z. Maybe he was onto something after all. This is how it was. Fawcett stumbled upon this super cool document called Manuscript 512 at the National Library of Brazil. It's believed to have been written by a Portuguese explorer. Now, according to this document, back in 1753, a group of explorers discovered the remains of an ancient city. It had arches, a statue, and even a temple with hieroglyphs. But the document didn't spill the beans on where the city was located. So Fawcett got all hyped up about finding this city and made it his secondary mission after his main goal of finding something called Z. At one point, he had to come back to Britain to run some errands, but in 1920, he decided to give it another shot. Fawcett went on a personal expedition to find the city, but it was unsuccessful. Five years later, Fawcett, his son Jack, and their buddy Raleigh Rimmel disappeared in the Mato Grosso jungle. Some researchers think that Fawcett might have been influenced by info he got from indigenous folks about this place called Kuhikagu. Turns out, Kuhikagu was discovered by Westerners in 1925, and it had the ruins of 20 towns and villages. Up to 50,000 people might have lived here. And get this, the discovery of other earthworks in southern Amazonia totally supports Fawcett's theory. In 2005, an American journalist wrote an article about Fawcett's crazy expeditions and discoveries. He called it the Lost City of Z. Catchy, right? Well, in 2009, he turned that article into a book with the same name. And in 2016, the super-talented writer-director James Gray made it into a movie. Now, here's where things get a bit sad. The Amazon region is changing rapidly. Farming, ranching, and energy production are changing this incredible place. And guess what? Those untouched areas with ancient relics won't stay untouched for long. It's a race against time to document and preserve what's left of our past before it's lost forever. Imagine discovering an ancient city without leaving the comfort of your home. In 1963, a man in the Nevsihir province of Turkey did exactly that. He was renovating his house. He knocked down a wall in his basement and found a mysterious room. He continued digging and saw a tunnel. This is how Darren Kuyu Underground City was found. Darren Kuyu is one of the deepest multi-level underground settlements of Cappadocia and in all of Turkey. This engineering masterpiece has eight levels. The inhabitants living on those floors had access to cellars, storage areas, chapels, a school, a study room, and other structures. All floors are connected by an extensive network of tunnels. It's believed that the underground city was built as a shelter. You can't see the construction from the outside. Its depth is approximately 279 feet. The complex was large enough to shelter about 20,000 people, plus their livestock and food supplies. There's also a 180-foot ventilation shaft. People used it both for ventilation and as a well. The well supplied water both to the villagers living on the surface and to those hiding in the underground city. Interestingly, those living on the bottom levels were able to cut off the water supply for the upper and ground levels. This kept the water safe from potential poisoning. The place was designed for protection. The tunnels could be blocked from the inside with huge round rolling stone doors. The passageways were extremely narrow. Potential invaders had to enter the tunnels one at a time. Seems like they thought of everything in the 7th century BCE. Archaeologists believed the Phrygians were the ones who first built the levels. After them, the structure was used and enhanced in Roman times. This was when the chapels were added. The golden time of Darin Kuyu, however, was during the Byzantine era. But how did these people manage to create such tunnels? Well, the rock they carved them into wasn't usual. It was soft volcanic rock. It appeared due to a geological process that began millions of years ago. Volcanic eruptions covered the area in thick ash. It then solidified into this soft rock. When the natural forces of wind and water eroded softer parts, only hard elements remained. Fun fact, fairy chimneys are also made of intricately shaped volcanic soft rock, but they formed naturally without any human intervention. I'm still in Turkey, 
But this time, my destination is Kanakale, where a myth came to life. For 3,000 years, people believed that Homer's Iliad was fiction and that Troy never existed. In 1863, everything changed. Expatriate Frank Calvert discovered ancient ruins in Western Turkey. He was convinced they belonged to the ancient city of Troy. Heinrich Schliemann examined this area in 1868. That's when Troy saw sunlight again after all those centuries. Troy has complex layers. Over the years, nine ancient cities were built on top of one another. Historians say that the area was strategically located between Europe and Asia, so it became a prosperous trade and cultural center. This strategic position made Troy attractive throughout history. After the Trojan conflict, the city was abandoned between the years 1100 to 700 BCE. Then Greek settlers rediscovered the area, and Alexander the Great ruled there. The Romans then invaded the city. Speaking of this event, the first thing you would see when visiting the site is a replica of the wooden Trojan horse from a movie shot in 2004. The next stop is Lothal. In the 1950s, Lothal and several other Harappan sites were discovered in India. These new provinces extended the boundaries of the Indus Valley civilization. Lothal was an important part of the Harappan civilization. It had vast cotton and rice fields. Plus, it had a bead-making factory. Beads were made from semi-precious stones, like agate. Many of these beads were later found in Mesopotamia, which serves as evidence that Lothal was a thriving trading port. Archaeologists believe that the city was part of an ancient trade route. Traces of agriculture? Check. Traces of trade? Check. What else? The remains of residential buildings, streets, bathing pavements, and drains some real city planning, and impressive examples of early urbanization. The town was well constructed. There were modern houses. Some of them had six rooms, bathrooms, a large courtyard, and even a veranda. Lothal also had the world's oldest known dock. It linked the city with the Sabarmati River and the trade route. The ancient Mayan city of Calakmul is located in southern Mexico in the tropical forest of the Tierras Bajas. From 500 CE to 800 CE, Calakmul was home to over 50,000 people. There was a central plaza surrounded by outer districts. And if we count both the inhabitants of all those outer areas and those who lived in the center, Calakmul had a population of more than 1.5 million people. It was a city that was habitable for 12 centuries. It's believed that the place had more constructions than any other excavated Maya settlements in the region. After 1000 CE, the Maya civilization there faced a downfall. The settlement that was once the center of Mesoamerica was almost completely abandoned. The ancient city was at the heart of the second largest tropical forest in America. The site is well preserved, so today, if you were to visit it, you would be able to picture what life looked like in ancient Mayan times. The city remains include architectural complexes and sculpted monuments, defensive systems, quarries, water management features, agricultural terraces, massive temple pyramids, and palaces. Not to mention a variety of body ornaments and other accompanying objects. It proves that complex state-organized societies lived in this tropical forest. The Mayans depicted nature in their paintings, pottery, sculptures, rituals, and even food. I'm moving on to a place people thought didn't really exist. The city of Thonis Heracleon appeared only in a few inscriptions and ancient texts. Turns out, it was waiting to be discovered for thousands of years. Scientists searched the majority of the coast of Egypt. But then, archaeologist Frank Gaudio and his team detected a colossal face looking at them from under the water. The ancient city of Heracleion was discovered completely submerged four miles off Alexandria's coast. In the ruins of the lost city, there were 64 ships, 700 anchors, and a treasure trove of gold coins. Archaeologists consider a 16-foot tall statue and the temple remains the most important findings discovered by the expedition. Back then, the city had ceremonies and celebrations that took place in the Temple of Amun. 
the ruins and artifacts were made from granite and diorite, so they were in good condition even after having been in contact with water for centuries. They give people a glimpse into what life was like 2,300 years ago in one of the most important trade ports of the world. The city had a network of canals. You can think of it as an ancient Egyptian Venice. The canals linked many separate harbors and anchorages. Towers, temples, houses, and other structures were also linked by bridges. Thonis Heracleion was the country's main port for international trade and the collection of taxes. No one really knows how the city ended up submerged, but archaeologists connect it with natural causes. At the end of the 2nd century BCE, most probably after a flood, Heracleion got covered with water. Then, Alexandria, the city founded by Alexander the Great, became more glorious than Heracleion. Before Alexandria's fame, Heracleion was the main port of entry to Egypt. So, after the disaster, many ships heading for Heracleion had to change their route and go to Alexandria. Heracleion lost its glory until its rediscovery in 1933. Mesa Verde is an American national park in Colorado. The park is the largest archaeological preserve in the U.S., with more than 5,000 sites, including 600 cliff dwellings. Mesa Verde means green table in Spanish. The name comes from the shape of the mountains in the area, with flat tops and steep sides. The park is an ancestral Puebloan archaeological site. Starting from 7500 BCE, a group of nomadic Paleo-Indians seasonally lived in Mesa Verde. They were hunters, gatherers, and crop farmers. They built the first Pueblos in the region. By the end of the 12th century, the Mesa Verdeans began constructing massive cliff dwellings, which are now the best-known structures in the park.